Morning. morning. Everyone hear me? Good. This morning, we're going to look at the ministry of all believers. Now, recall, not to the last time I spoke, but to the time before that, Now, we were still in lockdown at that time, so it was a recorded video. And for those of you who haven't seen that, I encourage you to go back onto the YouTube channel. Just search up Inverkeeving Baptist on YouTube, and you'll find find the channel. Scroll down the videos and find the priesthood of all believers, because that is what I spoke on last time. And I'll just give a quick recap of what I spoke on then. Uh, The priesthood of all believers is the doctrine that every single believer, every single Christian has a ministry. Every single Christian is a priest. And the uh, three main functions of a priest were to represent God to people through blessing, prayer, and evangelism, sharing our faith. To represent people to God through intercession, through prayer for one another, through prayer for uh, everyone. And to represent and to uh, minister to God through service uh, and prayer. Um, Yeah, sorry. Worship and prayer, to minister to God. And those were the three main functions of a priest. And actually, those were the ministry, the ministries that every Christian is called to. Now, remember, the word ministry simply means service. It translates the same Greek word. It's, It's service, ministry. Ministry is simply a fancy word for service. It's service for God, service to one another. That's all ministry is. It's not something that only a church leader does. It's something that everyone does. It's, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. It, continuing in that vein of the priesthood of all believers, that everyone has a ministry, we're going to continue that this morning, looking at more specific ministries, services that we are all called to do. And the way we're going to do that this morning is we're going to look at these, what I call the one another sayings. The one another sayings. As you read in the New Testament, you'll quickly find uh, a saying that will say something like, do something to one another. We had that classic example in uh, the song there, a new commandment I give unto you. It's, that's from uh, John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you that you may love one another. See there, that's a one another saying. You're loving someone else. Love one another. As I have loved you, you are to love one another. And then the next verse, by all this, people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that core idea there of loving one another, that's the foundation, the basis of all the other one another sayings in the New Testament. There are many more than that. Uh, I have a list of about 39 here. Uh, so I'm going to try and go through all of those as quickly as I can. But really the main idea is that we're to love one another and that all the other one another sayings are just an outworking of this first one, to love one another. But uh, first of all, to continue that idea of loving one another, we have... Uh, John 13, verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you also ought to wash one another's feet. Remember this in the context. This is Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples. And in the cultural context at the time, uh, people wore sandals and they would walk on very dirty roads filled with you know, animal poo and dirt and muck. And it was the job of a servant, whenever you went into a house, to wash the person's feet to get all the muck and dirt and poo off. And uh, we find this extraordinary act of love that Jesus does where he, their Lord and teacher, takes the place of a servant and washes his disciples' feet. And then he says, as I have done, as I have washed your feet, taken the place of a servant among you, so you're also to do that to one another. And that is simply an outworking of love, isn't it? We're to love one another as Jesus has loved us. How did Jesus love us? He served us. He gave his life up for us. He gave his life his life up for us as a sacrifice. That's why John continues in his first letter now, uh, first letter of John, chapter four, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever has been born of God. Uh, Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And then in verse 10 and 11, 
In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That may seem like a very simple idea, but actually uh, loving one another is a ministry. It is a service that every single Christian is called to. Not just the, the minister of the church, not just a pastor or a church leader, but every single Christian is called to this. We get the same idea again. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no one to anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor to each other. Uh, That first bit of loving one another... Paul actually uses two Greek words for love there. It's very interesting. He uses the Greek word that means brother love, uh, which is Philadelphia, brotherly love. But he also uses another word for love, which means uh, a family affection. It's the word that's used for a parent who loves their child, it's like a mother nursing her baby. It's that sort of very deep affection, a family love. And Paul says to, yes, have a brotherly love for one another, but also to have a deep family affection for one another, to treat one another as family, as siblings. Again, the idea of love appears in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. That includes sisters, by the way, as well. It's a sister love. It's a sibling love. Uh, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, Peter's actually quoting a proverb there. Love covers a multitude of sins. And uh, the idea there is that when we love one another... Love is preventative. It stops sinning happening. Because if we love one another, we're not, of course, we're not going to sin against one another. But also we're not perfect, which means we can sin against one another. And at, of course, love covers a multitude of sins also means that we forgive one another when we do sin or if we do sin against one another. Which is why, again, we have in Ephesians 4, verse 32, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You see the trend here. These are all an outworking of love, but it's all these different one another sayings. And this is what every Christian is called to for ministry. We're to forgive one another. And then Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. It's another one other thing. And if one has a complaint against another, uh, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive each other. So you see there's the forgiveness as an outworking for love. And then again, the idea of love uh, pops up again in Galatians 5, uh, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only, or sisters, <laughs> But do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, as in for sin or for your own gain, uh, for selfishness. But through love, serve one another. And then Galatians 5.26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Of course, if we love one another, we won't do that, will we? So you see that love one another is the foundation for all these one another sayings. And then James 4 Verse 11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if the if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Now, uh, James here, just to explain some contextual things, uh, James is uh, heavily inspired in many of his sayings in his letter from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel from chapters 5 to 7. And uh, in Matthew chapter five, nah, Matthew chapter seven, uh, Jesus opens that chapter with saying, "Judge not, and you shall not be judged." And we all know that we shouldn't judge one another. But the idea that Jesus is talking about there in context is he's, he is talking about hypocritical judging. 
It's about judging one another when we ourselves are doing the exact same things. Because in that very same passage, as you keep reading in Matthew 7, he says, once you take the log out of your own eye, then you can see clearly and take the speck out of your brother's eye. So it's not that you can't do any form of judgment, but it's that your judgment is a good judgment. It's an unhypocritical judgment where you're not doing the same thing. And it's the same idea here with James. He says, because he says, if you're a judge of the law, you're not a doer of the law. Well, the converse is true. If you're a doer of the law, then you can see clearly that maybe someone's not doing quite the law as well. But you're, the point is, is that you're not so concerned about someone else's behavior and you're just judging them when you yourself are not doing it. The point is that James is making is focus on your own behavior before someone else's. Don't be a hypocritical judge. And then again, James 5 verse 9, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Very severe warning there. Don't grumble against one another. But of course, if we love each other, we won't do that. And then Romans 14 verse 13, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, in context there in uh, Romans 14, Paul is talking about uh, sort of probably what we'd call secondary doctrine. It's the sort of things or things of scripture or God's word where there can be multiple interpretations and uh, one may be true, one may be not, but they're not of total concern. So we don't need to put a stumbling block in front of someone else. In Romans 14 specifically, it's about whether to... uh, eat particular meats, uh, sacrifice to idols, or whether to practice the Sabbath or not. And Paul says, like, yeah, I know that every day is as holy as the other, but if someone, speaking of Jewish believers, believes that the Sabbath is equally holy, well, then don't put a stumbling block in front of them. Don't just say, oh, the Sabbath's not holy. Uh, It's about not putting a hindrance of one another. It's about loving the other person. That's what Paul's talking about in context, about not passing a judgment on secondary matters of doctrine. And then, again, this uh, idea of the sort of negative, as it were, of not doing something bad to someone. We have, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. That's Colossians 3, verse 9. And then the sort of opposite of that, Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one of another. This idea of members one of another, uh, Paul is using body language. Now, I don't mean body languages and eye contact and gestures. I mean uh, that Paul is speaking about the body of Christ. He's using an image there about, uh, say, my hand is a member of my body or the cells are members of my body. Uh, In the same way, we are members of the body of Christ, all of us together. Uh, And because of that, therefore, we're members of one another. We're part of the same body. And so continuing that body idea we find in Romans 12, verse 5, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. We're united. We're a family. We're a body of Christ. And then Paul, describing the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, then says as a result of, the body all working together in harmony. He says that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 to 27. And then Ephesians 4, verse 1 to 3, uh, speaking again of the unity of the body, uh, but also bringing up that idea of bearing of one another again. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Eager, uh, sorry, Yes, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And continuing that same idea of living in harmony with one another, living in unity, uh, 
Romans 12, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. And then with the idea of living in harmony, we're also to welcome one another. Romans 12, oh, sorry, Romans 15, verse 7, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And then Ephesians 5, 21, we're to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And uh, a weird one for us to hear today, but Romans 16, 16, and it appears in a bunch of other verses too, but I'll just give the one example. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, what's the difference between a holy kiss and an unholy kiss? Three seconds. Uh, so don't do that. <laughs> but uh, the idea that I think Paul's expressing here is that the, the early Christians would have this obviously very uh, outward expression of uh, affection for one another with a holy kiss. I do believe it was... Uh, a well, we assumed that it was restricted between the sexes, so men would sort of have a nice affectional, affectionate kiss towards other men and women towards women. Uh, but, obviously, today, that doesn't really fit our culture or style, and we can't really do it because of COVID anyway, so don't kiss one another after this. Uh, but I do think what the principle behind it is this idea that we can display affection for one another. Maybe it just be a hug or a, you know, a wave or a hi, how are you? give you a cup of tea is a very British way of saying I love you, you know, uh, or I'll buy you a chippy. Uh, you know, this express love for one another. That's the principle behind it. So we're to show, we're not just to say we love one another is the point, we're to actually show we love one another. Uh, that's the, the principle behind it. And then finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Again, the idea of we're comforting one another, we're agreeing with one another. It's this, we're living in peace, we're living in harmony, we're one body, we're one family. Uh, here's one from the Gospels, uh, Mark 9, verse 50. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, the image of salt there, salt was a preservative. It would preserve sort of meat. It was a good thing. It preserves, so it preserves the good. It can erode away germs and evil. And it also brings out the flavor and stuff. And Jesus saying, have salt in yourselves. It means, you know, be people who bring out the, the individual flavors in one another. Bring out the individual characteristics, personality. Bring out the best in one another. Preserve the good in one another. And roads the evil away from each other. Be at peace with one another. That's what Jesus is meaning there. I think. Uh, then First Peter 5.5. 5, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but it gives grace to the humble. So there you go. That's, that's all the sayings for at least for unity, for humility. But there's some more here. Uh, there, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Encourage one another. Build one another up, just as you are doing. And then Hebrews. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as in some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day, that is the day of the Lord, drawing near. That's Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And then Hebrews three thirteen, Exhort, not extort. Exhort, which means to encourage, to build up. Not extort. Don't extort one another. Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today. That none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. See, there's a benefit right there to exhorting, not extorting, exhorting one another, to uh, encouraging one another. It saves us from the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is very deceitful. It can harden us, harden our hearts very quickly. But when we are encouraging one another, every day it says, when we're encouraging one another as fellow believers, it saves us from the hardness of heart that comes from the deceitfulness of sin. And then... Uh, Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're to help one another, encourage one another, build one another up. We're to be family. 
And then here's a very interesting sort of section of one another sayings, which actually tell us about teaching. Uh, Romans 15, verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Now, Paul goes on in the next verse to say, but nevertheless, I you know, wrote this letter, i.e. the letter of Romans, to remind you of some things. Uh, but his point here in the verse is that he expected the Christians who did have knowledge to instruct those who didn't, or to instruct one another. The point is here is that if you know something, if you know God's word, you are to instruct one another. In other words, your terms of the Christian life... Your source of teaching for the Christian life is not just from a pulpit every Sunday. That's important. The preaching and public reading of the word is very important. But it cannot be your only source as a Christian. You are to instruct one another. You are to study God's word for yourself so that you can learn and be able to, hey, you didn't know this. Oh, here, I'll tell you about it. It's not in a, not in a proud way, but, you know, in a humble way. Oh, wow, I just found this out. Hey, oh, you didn't know that. I'll share it with you. We're to instruct one another with what we know. If we don't know anything, that's fine. But if we do know something about God's word, <laughs> instruct one another in it. The job of a teacher is not just from the pulpit. We're actually, every single one of us are involved in teaching. Every single one of us is called to teaching. Here's another verse that says that. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teaching... And admonishing one another. I think that means build up again. Uh, or encouraging one another. Sort of stirring one another up. In all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There you have it. The, the idea of letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, of course, implies that we are to not just listen to get our, all our teaching from a pulpit every Sunday morning. That's very good. Again, please do that. Please listen to me. <laughs> but... You're also to study God's word for yourself and to study God's word with everyone else so that you can let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then from that place, knowing God's word, you're able to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom because you know God's word and God's word gives wisdom. And so we're able to share with one another what we've learned from God's word and that builds us up and that that builds up the body. That's part of loving one another is teaching Again, the same idea, slightly said slightly differently in Ephesians 5.19. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Uh, The key thing there is that actually addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, it's slightly different from the Colossians verse, and that the idea here is that we're actually to, there's this idea of we're, we're speaking to one another in song form, in musical form, in, or in a creative way. We're addressing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs. This idea of that we're teaching one another through the, through praise and worship, through singing songs about God. And that, well, that's why corporate worship is so important, is actually that we can sing to one another. And it's like, oh, yes, that song, I needed to hear that today. To give a, a, an example, which happened just this morning, if you've not met Jordan, by the way, please go talk to him. He's a very nice man. Uh, he's at the back there. He was in his car this morning, and he just told me this, so I was like, I'll use this for an example. He was in his car this morning, and he was listening to a Rent Collective song called Rescuer. And as soon as he was he was singing it out, and as soon as he was singing it, he felt the Lord just put Cameron there at the back in his mind. And he's like, I need to share this song with Cameron. Uh, and he did, and uh, hopefully Cameron will put that into practice. But there's this idea of we're addressing one another with songs. We can share songs with one another, and that builds us up in faith. So if you ever listen to a Christian song or a worship song, and you go, wow, that really touched my heart, share it with one another. It builds us up. And finally, we have, well, not finally, but some more, we have this idea of uh, confessing sins to one another and praying for one another. Uh, James 5, verse 16 Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then this last bit of the verse is my translation. Uh, The spirit energized prayer of a righteous person is very strong. 
I say it's my translation because uh, it is my translation. Not every translation, like the ESV, doesn't put that. But I think that is what the Greek most likely means. It has this idea of that there's this energizing is the main word, but it's in a passive, which means that the God or you know the Spirit, therefore, is energizing the prayer of a righteous person, which is why I said the Spirit energized prayer. This idea, it's not just any prayer. It's a prayer that is... Spirit empowered, where the Holy Spirit equips us, empowers us to pray something. And that kind of prayer is very powerful. Very powerful indeed. And that's why we're to pray for one another with the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, uh, almost finally, sorry, we're to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's First Peter 4.9. And then First Thessalonians 5.15, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. And this is the final one another saying that I'll end with. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So hopefully you can see from all those one another sayings, that actually is the job of every Christian to build up one another, to stir up one another, to love one another, to honour one another, to comfort one another, to care for one another, to be a family, to be members of one another, to be united, to comfort, to care, everything, and to serve one another. And this last verse here, this idea of receiving a gift from God, we've all received gifts, every one of us. We may not know it, but every single one of us has a gift from God. At least one. I think lots of people actually have more than one gift. But whatever we have received from God, the idea here is that we're to use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, i.e. God gives out a variety of gifts just from his grace, from from his gracious heart. And that is how we're to serve one another. And this one anothering is a sort of it's not the only ministry that Christians do, but it's a, we're con- it's a continuation of actually, what are the ministries that every Christian is called to? Well, the start of it is we're one anothering one another. With all these things, we're loving one another. And that is the ministry of every Christian. I'm now going to end in prayer. And then we're going to sing a song called An Army of Ordinary People. Uh, or listen to it anyway. Uh, it's by Dave Bilbra. And actually, it was written in Livingston. So it's a Scottish song. Uh, there you go. But it's all about the idea that actually every single person is called to ministry. Every single person is called to the service of God. Not just the particular church leader, but every single one of us. It's an army of ordinary people. That's every single one of us. We're all just ordinary. Although God does make us extraordinary by the power of his spirit, but God makes everyone that by the power of his spirit. It's not just particular people, it's everyone. God pours up on, out his spirit on all flesh. No one's left out. We're all one body. We've all got gifts to give. We've all got a ministry to serve with. So thank you, Father.